Wow! Welcome to Hip Views History, guys. I'm Dizzy, and I'm Dizzy for the Constitution because we're doing the Constitution for Dummies series, banging out the Eighth Amendment. Um, I think words are really important, and if you're going to engage in political debate, if you're going to have an opinion, everyone's got an opinion, let's base it on the words of the Constitution and not your feelings. Although I do think your feelings count. So giddy up for the learning. We're about to drop it on you like a sack of potatoes. Bang. All right, let's look at the words, guys. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. Now, before we break up those words, I think it's important that we all understand that the Eighth Amendment has been selectively incorporated, and of course you've learned this in previous lectures, that selective incorporation is when the Supreme Court is going to take the Fourteenth Amendment with its prohibition on the states of violating its due process or equal protection of its citizens, and it's going to apply some of the Bill of Rights to the states. So for instance, we all understand that the First Amendment has a protection of uh, of religion, the free exercise of religion. So if Alabama passed a law saying you couldn't pray to the fairy room goddess, that would be in violation of the First Amendment, but only using the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Due Process Clause to apply that First Amendment. So the Eighth Amendment has been selectively incorporated, meaning that we have rules about the Eighth Amendment that apply to the states. Now, where does the Eighth Amendment come from? Well, if you go to Great Britain and English history, you're really looking at the English Bill of Rights, which has pretty much the exact same language, and that found its way into the Bill of Rights because we so much want to protect our basic human dignity against the tyranny and the power of the states when it comes to punishing uh, people for crimes. So, let's look at some different parts of the Eighth Amendment. Excessive bail shall not be required. Um, bail, of course, is what somebody puts up as a defendant, money-wise, in order to guarantee that they are going to come back to trial. So the concept is that you really can't use bail to be punitive, to punish the crime. You're just using it to guarantee the person comes back. So excessive has been basically said to have to be reasonably calculated, and it has to be used in light of the perceived evil. So reasonably calculated would probably go to the idea that um, if I work on Wall Street and I'm stealing money from the firm, um, maybe my bail is going to be a million dollars because I work on Wall Street. If I am homeless and um, I rob a 7-Eleven, you know, the cash register, 50 bucks, I probably i am not going to get a million dollar bail because I'm never going to be able to come up with it. So it needs to be calculated reasonably depending on you know, the circumstances. And also on the perceived evil. So if I chop up a thousand people into little body parts and spread them all over the city, um, my bail might be a million dollars, probably should be a gillion dollars. As opposed to if I uh, you know, steal a Twinkie, my bail obviously can't be the same, the perceived evil. Excessive fines. Excessive fines has been clarified and defined by the court by saying that um, you can't have excessive fines without due process. That you can have high fines, but it, there has to be due process. So if a jury awards um, somebody with a disease living next to a power plant a million dollars, that might seem like it's excessive, but excessive is really in the eye of the beholder, and you've had due process as the corporation. You've had a jury trial. Now, if we pass a law, and we fine you a million dollars a day for polluting too much, that's probably excessive because you as a corporation have not had a chance to respond. There's no due process. Now, cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. That's where you're really going to get into the debates about the death penalty and torture and those types of things. Um, first, I would say that this has been defined in terms of what violates cruel and unusual. It's end, by the way, not or. So you can be cruel, but you can't be cruel and unusual. You can be unusual, but you can't be unusual and cruel. Um, and one of the most famous court decisions in 1972, Furman versus Georgia, the Supreme Court came up with basically um, a, a test to find out if something was violating um, the cruel and unusual language of the Eighth Amendment. Number one, they said that the punishment can't be degrading. It can't be torture. It can't be used just to totally humiliate you. Number two, it can't be arbitrary. It can't be kind of like in the eye of the beholder. It has to be really clear that this is the punishment. Arbitrary means that you're kind of, you know, winging it. 
And number three, it has to be totally rejected by society. Or if it's unnecessary punishment, if it's just being um, done not for justice reasons. So using that test in 1972, the Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty violated that. And everybody that was on death row um, got off their death row, was converted to life sentences like, Ma like Charles Manson. He was given the death penalty for those uh, murders, the Sharon Tate murders, but he's still alive. That's because of the 72 Furman decision. And then the court reapplied the test to the death penalty in 1976, Gregg versus Georgia, and they reversed themselves. But you still have that test. So if a state passes a, I don't know, a punishment law where they're going to hang people upside down on crosses on Main Street, um, that test would say that that would be unconstitutional. There's some other selectively incorporated rules. Um, we don't execute minors in this country. Um, we do not execute the mentally handicapped in this country. Um, but other than that, it's really up to the states to kind of decide for themselves if they want to have the death penalty. You can have that debate down in the comments below. Um, the only other case that's really applicable here, and I have a problem saying the word applicable, but is uh, Harleman versus Michigan, uh, which was a court case that tested um, whether or not sending somebody to life for prison for a drug offense violated kind of the um, cruel and unusual punishment language and the court basically said that it did not so if you have a state law like three strikes and you're out and then your third strike is you robbed a 7-eleven and now you're gonna get life imprisonment that might seem excessive it might seem cruel and unusual for the crime but the courts have decided that that's not that um, the states can decide for themselves whether they want those laws I talk too much but you're growing your brain aren't you alright you can check right here actually if you click the monkey the monkey will take you to uh, the playlist for the Constitution for Dummies series and I'll tell you what if you click Benjamin Franklin right there, you can subscribe to Hip Use History. How much fun would that be? I mean, really, think about it. Clicking Benjamin Franklin would be so much fun. I know that you're doing it right now because you can't hold yourselves back. All right, that's, kind of, that's it, guys. Make sure you check the description. We have lots of other EDU channels that you should be checking out. And uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, remember, where attention goes, energy flows. And uh, I think I'm done. See you later. <laughs>